Uh, first off, I am Ben Dronin. I am a Kubernetes platform engineer at Ford Motor Company. I'm Anjali Telang. I am the principal product manager for OpenShift Authentication and Identity. And uh, we're going to be talking about Workload Identity Federation and why you should stop using long-lived credentials. So by a show of hands, how many of you guys are using uh, accessing some cloud resource from your Kubernetes cluster? OK, how many of you are using Workload Identity Federation to do that? OK, so like a good number of you are already doing exactly what we're going to be talking about doing. But wait, how many of you are not doing that? I mean, you're using service account keys, client ID, client secret. OK, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of you. So that's perfect. We're glad you're here. So for all those who raise their hands, please stop doing that. <laughs> uh, OK, so um, workload identity is required to uniquely identify a workload. Uh, so that when it accesses the cluster and uh, authenticates to other applications, we are able to monitor it and track it, right? So good news is that Kubernetes already comes with workload identity. Many of you raised your hands and uh, you're aware of service accounts. Most of you are aware of service, service accounts here, right? So um, Service accounts are treated just like any other user in Kubernetes. Uh, any other user or group, they, you can apply RBAC policies to the, the service accounts, and uh, you can use them on the cluster for um, uh, communicating between services on the cluster. You can also use them uh, for, for any external applications that want to run tasks and um, automation on the cluster. So thanks to the SIGOTH team for thinking through workload identity um, you know, very early on when they built uh, Kubernetes. We are going to take a little bit of trip down memory lane with how uh, you know, service accounts were and what was the landscape like pre-Kubernetes uh, 121. That's a long time back. Well, actually not. It's just three years back. Uh, so uh, let's look at how it was. I have to use the clicker, yeah. So this was the landscape just, you know, some three years back. So you had uh, service account tokens. Many of them had tokens that uh, didn't expire and they were long lived tokens. You could use that to communicate between services. Uh, you could use that, as I mentioned, to run from external applications to run automated tasks on the cluster, like creating an application, running, updating an application, et cetera. Um, and then uh, for services that wanted to talk to external entities, well, you couldn't use service account tokens because service account tokens were specific to the cluster, um, there was no federation available uh, between uh, the service account issuer and uh, any other identity provider outside. So really, you could use them only on the cluster or to run services on the cluster. What did uh, typically folks do if they wanted to use uh, or communicate with external applications? Long-lived API tokens, long-lived certificates, MTLS is not the answer for everything. So uh, uh, yeah, I see a lot of laughs there. So um, we all agree long-lived tokens can create problems, right? What are some of the problems? Uh, your credential can be stolen. They are prone to exfiltration attacks. Um, you don't know how many times the bad actor has used your token, how many times the bad actor has shared the token. So. Really, uh, you know, you cannot control the blast radius, and these are extremely prone to attacks. Um, some statistics uh, that I want to highlight in a um, re recent Cloud Security Alliance report in 2024, it was reported that 80% of the organizations using cloud uh, reported a security incident, at least one, at least one security incident. And that's a huge number, right? So one of the factors, the second most uh, important factor in this was identity and access management. Any guesses which was the most important factor that caused the breaches and security issues? Uh, misconfigurations, human errors. <laughs> so automation is the answer. So definitely automate and make sure that your identity and access management is set up correctly. 
passwords as part of that gap. So as you can see, uh, long-lived uh, token usage is definitely a big no-no. Luckily, uh, you know, our upstream folks have been working hard since Kubernetes 120, and the landscape has changed quite a bit. So this is how it looks like now. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on the right side, but let me give you a quick brief on the left side as well. So uh, for external applications that want to um, you know, communicate with services on the cluster, you can use bound service account tokens now. These are time bound, they are audience bound. Um, if you use projected service account tokens, then they are auto-rotated by the kubelet. So this is the right approach if you want to use for communication on the cluster, or while you're running applications uh, that want to you know, run uh, tasks on the cluster, uh, external applications. Uh, the one other thing you could do is also use uh, uh, OIDC um, access and run client credential workflows. Uh, from external IDP, there's a lot of good work that has been done in Kubernetes lately with structured auth and integration of OIDC. So um, you could use client credential for talking to services on the cluster as well. But let's focus on the right side here um, and workload identity federation. So uh, uh, big kudos uh, to the team that uh, really understood that short-lived credentials is the right approach. And um, they made it possible to federate with external identity providers using um, service account issuer OIDC uh, discovery support. So now you have a well-known endpoint from where you can get the issuer information. So you can get the issuer, you can get uh, the public key uh, that have signed the tokens, and then you can create a federation relationship on your external IDP. So when your application on the cluster is trying to access an application outside the cluster that um, using your service account tokens, what uh, what will happen is it will be redirected to the IDP. The IDP will go and validate the token. It already has that trust relationship. And once it validates the token, it will provide an access token that uh, the application can use to talk to the external application. This is the right approach. So all of you who raised your hands, this is for you. <laughs> uh, so this is great in theory. But let's look at how it looks in practice, how it looks like in a production environment at scale. And for that, I'll hand it over to Ben. Awesome. So let's see here. All right, so first, a legal disclaimer. Uh, gotta do this, sorry. I don't speak on behalf of Ford. If I say we, I'm not speaking as Ford. I'm speaking as myself and my immediate team that deals with this stuff all the time. And Ford Motor Company and myself are not endorsing any project, product, or service that I mentioned in this presentation. Cool. So uh, Ford's cloud journey has been ramped up dramatically in the past four years. Um, we've been in the cloud space for some time now. Adoption started in 2016 with Cloud Foundry, and then we quickly also started using Kubernetes in 2017. Um, over the past four years, uh, it's the cloud first mindset has been pushed super, super heavily. Um, we want people to be using the cloud to deploy their applications, whatever it may be, something to support the business, external facing stuff, that kind of thing. Um, so prior to this push for adop cloud adoption, um, we were using Ford was using uh, long live credentials with long expiry times. Um, and this was not ideal. It was pretty painful. Uh, for one, outages. If you're using these long-lived credentials and they have a, you know, they do ha eventually have an expiry time. A lot of times it's around a year or so. Um, when that year comes around and someone forgets to renew it, that's a problem, especially if like someone left the company and they were getting a bunch of emails that uh, credentials about to expire. Service gets interrupted, the business isn't happy. That's not fun. Um, the other thing is uh, credential mismanagement. People would leave secrets stored on their local machines in emails, push it to Git. That's not fun. Um, no one likes that. Everyone, everyone disliked that. So uh, another thing, toil. No one likes doing it. No one likes rotating secrets. It's just 
kind of a painful process, and obviously all of the security um, disadvantages that Anjali was talking about. So um, when the company began to push for a cloud-first mindset, it became obvious that this was not going to be a sustainable pattern at scale. Um, so like, for ex just to put it in perspective, there are 7,000 namespaces just in our Tekton clusters alone that are only doing CI CD workloads all the time. And you can imagine that every single one of these would need some credential to talk to cloud providers to do whatever it is that your CI CD system needs to do. And this doesn't include any namespaces that are running like actual applications, it's just for CI CD at Ford. So like, this is a crazy amount of namespaces. Every single one would need credentials it would not have scaled well. So um, it was decided that when this push was being made, that long-lived credentials for accessing cloud resources were gonna be the exception and not the norm. So as such, uh, Ford adopted this, this uh, strategy here, use workload identity wherever possible, whether running in Kubernetes or not. So other platforms can also do workload identity. It's not unique to Kubernetes, but obviously we're at KubeCon, we're talking about Kubernetes, we do workload identity with Kubernetes. So we can sum it up with this little flow chart here. If, if you need to authenticate to the cloud, use workload identity. If you don't, you, well, don't need to talk about it. If it didn't work when you tried it, why did it not work? If Ford wrote it, fix it so you can use workload identity and then use workload identity. If Ford didn't write it, talk to the vendor who did write it. And if it doesn't support workload identity, you have to obtain, uh, you put in an engineering request or a feature request, and you have to obtain an ex exception so that you can use long-lived credentials within our uh, cloud environments. Um, but obviously, the preference is ask the vendor to support workload identity, and then you'll be good to go. So uh, whoops, that was not great. There we go. So this is just an example. Once again, not endorsing any of these things. This is just an example of what we use in kind of our sphere of influence within Ford. Um, and the biggest one being, like many other companies, when you talk about workload identity is CI CD. Um, we do use Tekton and primarily Terraform, the, the uh, non-VSL one. <laughs> um, but uh, we use those for most of our cloud provisioning as well as all, all those other projects that you see there. Um, every single one of these is using workload identity to talk to our various cloud providers and we don't use long-lived credentials to do any of this stuff. Um, so it works really, really great if you use a lot of the CNCF ecosystem. A lot of it already has workload identity support built in. Um, so that's super awesome. So for example, Ford has an internal uh, Ford cloud portal based on Backstage to get application teams bootstrapped with cloud resources. It comes with a Tekton namespace. That Tekton namespace comes with workload identity pre-configured. Developers are ready to go to provision resources into the cloud using our infrastructure as code tool of choice at the moment. Um, just to get them bootstrapped and they can do all this stuff without needing to ever configure long live credentials. So that's super cool. Um, there's a bunch more we could talk about here, but in the interest of time, we'll move on. So uh, what do you need to do it? So the first thing you're gonna need is a public OIDC service account issuer endpoint. Um, that is the yellow field there. Um, if you want to look at how this works, you can generate a JOT token from kubectl, and you can use that little JC uh, CLI to parse it out into a nice JSON structure here for you. Um, so that's what that issuer endpoint looks like. Um, I'm, it, it can be whatever you want. You can use ingress to expose it. You can use a S3 uh, bucket. It just has to be publicly available. Um, the second thing is you need a Kubernetes service account, and you have to know the subject claim of that service account. So for Kubernetes, uh, all of them take the format system, colon, service account, colon, namespace, colon, service account name. So this is namespace scoped. Um, when you do workload identity, it's always from the namespace. Um, you, so it works great with multi-tenancy. And then you define the allowed audience for the token exchange. Um, what this looks like uh, can depend on the cloud provider you're trying to use and what you're trying to do workload identity with. Um, some projects require you to use a particular audience because it's hard coded in their um, code to use a particular audience. So that's good to know. And then the expiry, obviously the cloud provider will check to see if the token is expired or not. So that's, that's super important. Um, and it will also usually be required to be like time bound to like an hour. It kind of depends on cloud provider, but that's kind of the norm. So let's, uh, let's do a demo. Let's see what it actually looks like to use workload identity. Alrighty. I cannot see. Ugh. Oh, one. There we go. Cool. So, sweet. 
So to start with, like we said, we need a publicly available OIDC endpoint. Um, so I'm going to spin up a minikube cluster, and we're going to enable workload identity on that minikube cluster. And then we're going to actually use workload identity with an open source uh, CNCF project or kube, kube project or whatever it is. So um, I'm, I'm using OpenTofu to spin up a Google storage bucket. I'm making that storage bu bucket public so that I can satisfy the requirement of having a public OIDC issuer. And I pre-created this ahead of time so we don't have to watch a plan and apply and stuff like that. So uh, we're going to start our Minikube cluster. We're going to specify these two API server args, um, one for specifying the OIDC well-known endpoints, um, the issuer, which is the issuer, um, service count issuer, and then one is the public key endpoint. Um, we're going to upload both of those things to the bucket after the cluster starts up. So. This might take a minute. I actually did already start this ahead of time. Um, so it's just kind of making sure the configuration matches just so that all the images that we're going to use were pre-cached and we'd have to wait for pods to spin up and stuff like that. OK, awesome. So we're going to first look at a service count token. Um, you can see the issuer up there um, is our bucket that we created using OpenTofu. Um, that is number one field that we said. We need the, the issuer to be something that we know and is publicly available so that our cloud providers can validate our tokens that we're about to send up. Uh, the subject inf information is right there on kind of down here. If I had a laser pointer. Yeah. <laughs> so th that's going to be super important when we configure our IAM policies and our cloud providers. And then the expiry, it's probably something that you need to decode and we're not going to worry about. OK, so did I mess this up? Okay. cool. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to upload our uh, OpenID uh, configuration endpoint to our Google storage bucket. Awesome. Then we're going to upload the keys. Awesome. Now we're ready to use workload identity in any cloud provider that we want to use. So to show you what that looks like, I've got a bunch of open tofu code of just to provide an example of what it actually looks like to do in the, to use workload identity in these cloud providers. So starting off with AWS, um, you have to configure one of these uh, open ID connect provider resources. Um, you have to provide it the issuer URL, the uh, client ID list, which is actually the audiences that you want to use. Um, and then the thumbprint list, which is based off the HTTPS certificate that you're serving your OIDC endpoint from. Um, I have some commands that you can, all the stuff is going to be available on my GitHub, but I have some commands to have how you can get that thumbprint. Then if we're talking about Azure, um, you're going to need to spin up an Azure AD application. Um, it's a little bit different if you're using like AKS and managed identities. I'm not going to get into that, but this, this, this will work in any cluster. So, um, you spin up your Azure AD application, you spin up a service principle associated with that application, and then the magic is this part right here where you configure the federated identity credential. Um, it's a little bit different from the other two major cloud providers in that you have to define this at per uh, application, not like in a generic like pool or um, open ID provider um, resource. And then in Google Cloud, uh, you, you spin up a workload identity pool in a provider, and then you provide that same kind of information. Um, you provide the, let's scroll down a little bit. You can provide the issuer information, the allowed, the allowed audiences inf issuer information, and then you configure the IAM policies for each one of these things as you would with a regular like service account in these cloud providers, and I'll show you how to do that as well. So let's actually use this for something. That's what we want. So we're going to try out secret store CSI driver. I know we're talking about not using long live credentials, but secret store CSI driver is super cool because it lets you use workload identity to grab credentials. So if you need them, it's kind of a good way to do it. So we'll go ahead and give it a shot. So just to show you what we're actually working with here, I've gone ahead and provisioned secrets in each one of these cloud providers. Uh, obviously don't do this this way. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's for a demo. It's fine. Don't do it this way. <laughs> um, 
so I've I've gone ahead and spit up spun up an uh, AWS Secrets Manager secret. I'm adding information into that secret, secret from AWS, doing the same thing for the other two. And then I'm defining the actual IAM role and policy um, so that our workload identity, um, so that our service account in Kubernetes can use workload identity to authenticate and grab the secret. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time. If you use these cloud providers, you should already know how to do this because you're doing it for other things that are not using workload identity. So it should be relatively straightforward. Same thing for Azure. We have a secret, secret from Azure. It's gonna be put in the Azure Key Vault, and then in GCP, in GCP, we have secret from GCP. All these things are already provisioned because it takes a little bit of time to provision them. So I've gone ahead and done that ahead of time. And uh, we're gonna install the operator. Uh, I've already kind of done this, so it's already there. Um, secret Store CSI driver provides a secret provider class. This is how you tell uh, the, the secret store CSI driver how to actually go and look for those secrets. You tell it, you know, what uh, client ID are you going to use, what tenant ID in Azure. In AWS, you define the ARN of the secret. And then in GCP, if I can scroll here, in GCP, you tell it like the, the uh, uh, project name and stuff like that. So this is all I've configured. I haven't, there's no secrets hidden anywhere. All this stuff is on my GitHub. You can look at it. Um, and then we're going to create a pod. Um, we're going to use the secret store CSI driver to create these volumes that will project these secrets into the file system and into these places. It's going to mount them. The secret's going to be there. It's going to be great. It's going to work, we hope. OK, so that's all ready to go. We'll apply the pod. Make sure the pod is ready. Yep. All right, so uh, we're going to do an LS in those directories where we mounted those secrets in. And we can see all three of them are there. So let's go ahead and cat them out and see if they actually have the values that they, we claim that they do. And they do. So secret from AWS, secret from Azure, secret from GCP. There's no credentials. It was just me uploading those two things into that public GCS storage bucket um, and then pointing the cloud providers at that storage bucket. So all that was happening is the secret store CSI driver is just taking the Kubernetes service account token associated with this pod, exchanging it for the access token for that particular cloud provider, and then using that to access the secret resource and project it into the pod. So this is awesome. We didn't need to use any secrets but we can still use it to do things. And you can use, use this, in, for the most part, in, it, within any application. So, uh, awesome. All right, so this works great for a single cluster. If, you're, if you don't run at like a ton, a super large scale, you should use this. But what about if you're using a ton of, you have a ton of clusters that you're managing, hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, it's kind of tedious to be able to have to do this every time. Uh, trying to get use, <laughs> trying to get developers to use workload identity for their stuff is hard enough. Uh, try, trying to get them to each configure their own OIDC issuers for every cluster. Trying to get them to communicate that to them. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the rear. It's not fun. Uh, moving workloads between clusters requires them to reconfigure all their IAM. They a lot of times don't know how to do that. Uh, and wouldn't it be nice if it was possible to federate with a single issuer? So I'm going to pass it back to Angeline. and she's going to talk about something that might be helpful in this situation. Awesome. All right. So Ben, that was a great demo, by the way. Um, so I want to pick on what Ben mentioned. Um, have a single schema. It's very important to have a single schema, not just for ease of use, but also for making sure that you are providing the right set of policies across uh, you know, your clusters. You're making sure that uh, you know, you're uh, using your resources in the right way. So uh, if you do automation, then the cost of automation is also lower. Um, and um, you know, the cost of maintenance is also lower if you have a single schema that uh, can address your federation requirements across the various uh, cloud, uh, you know, whether you have it on prem or uh, in a cloud provider or on the edge or very far edge as well. So, so that's the requirement. We want a solution that can federate across all these different uh, uh, cloud platforms 
and uh, we want it to be open source. So luckily, we have Spiffy Inspire, which works with Kubernetes as well. Spiffy Inspire uh, are graduated CNCF projects. They have been used in production by many organizations. We have some really awesome developers here who work very hard to, uh, you know, make Spiffy Inspire uh, available to all of, uh, you know, to all the users. Um, so Spiffy Inspire can really federate and provide short-lived verifiable identities. That's the Spiffy, the standard for providing this uh, um, identity framework. And uh, these uh, Spiffy IDs um, consist of a trust domain as well as a workload. That's the Spiffy ID. It's included in a SVID, which is uh, a, ver a, a Spiffy verifiable document. And uh, it can be in the form of X509 or JOT. And uh, these are short-lived, they, uh, they, they are rotated, um, the rotation and the uh, issuance, everything is handled by Spire, which is the implementation of Spiffy. So uh, as, as you can see from this diagram, it can federate across all of these different platforms. And if you were part of the workload identity date yesterday, there was one very cool presentation where uh, they talked about using Spire at the far edge, they actually had Spire deployments on a vessel in the middle of an ocean with very limited Starlink connectivity. So really, it scales and federates across all of these different platforms. Um, the Spire architecture itself consists of a Spire server. That's the brains of Spire and uh, Spire agent, uh, which, is deployed on, uh, which is deployed on the node. So the Spire server is the one that issues uh, the SVIDs. It is the one that uh, uh, provides the workload registrations. It is also uh, doing node and workload level, so node level attestation. So every time an agent is deployed on a node, the agent has to be attested, and the node has to be verified by Spire. And Spire does uh, the verification of the attestation out of bounds. So in case of Kubernetes, um, it uses service accounts uh, and it does the out of bound uh, validation using the token review API. Now, uh, Spire uh, server is very extensible. It uh, integrates with a lot of plugins. OIDC is one of them. Uh, so it provides OIDC discovery and can federate with an external uh, IDP, OIDC IDP as well. It also provides uh, uh, the Spire Controller Manager, which is uh, you know which is what is used for Kubernetes uh, registration. So if you have workloads, they'll automatically get registered with the Spire server because it deploys each of the Spire agents as a daemon set on the cluster. So it really has a very extensible um, plugin architecture. One of the cool plugins that it comes with is Tonyak, which is a user management um, plugin. And it helps with federation, ease of federation, dynamic federation. Um, and it uh, also helps with management of Spiffy IDs. We have uh, the maintainers of that project here. Maya and Maria, shout out to you guys. So uh, uh, great work that they are doing upstream on this. And uh, so Sp that's the Spire server. The Spire agent itself, uh, like I said, uh, is per node. And it will uh, provide a workload API that uh, the applications can access to get Spiffy IDs. And uh, it does workload level attestation. In case of Kubernetes, it will the, the workload attestor plugins will get the pod ID from your C group membership, and then um, uh, contact the kubelet and get uh, information about the application, and it matches that information with the registration entry and provides you with a Spiffy ID. So that's in a nutshell how Spire works. Um, Spire federates between Spire servers, so you can set up the federation relationship. And uh, when you want workload, say, from cluster A to talk to cluster B, then you federate across these two servers. And you also tell the workload uh, that uh, it needs to use the Spire server B by using federates with uh, as the uh, configuration. So 
that Spire, in a nutshell, um, you know, there have been lots of talks on Spiffy and Spire. This is the right way to go in terms of uh, using short-lived tokens, uh, using federation, and uh, you know, uh, all of your multi-cloud needs can be um, addressed. So uh, that's you know that's the recommendation that we had, and uh, that's the future direction that we encourage everyone to try out. Um, and I think uh, we want to wrap up here and take some questions from you guys. Yeah, so there's a mic up here if you guys want to, if there's any questions for us. I just want to say, like, this is just as easy as using client ID, client secret, service account keys, simply because you only have to configure it once and you never have to worry about it again which is super nice. Yes. Do I have a link to the demo? Yes, I do. There you go, sir. Yes. We are in the process of adopting. The question was, do you already use Spire? Uh, so thanks, Ben. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Testing. Thank you for the talk. So you talked about uh, this for generating tokens to access cloud resources. Any thought about uh, on-premise resources, uh, internal cloud providers, vSphere, integration with any providers like that, if you're not just using public cloud? So if you're not using public cloud uh, and if you have an identity provider that you can federate with, uh, sure, you can use it with on-prem clusters also. Yeah, it, it works with, so that, to be clear, this works with any cluster, right? We just spun it up on Minikube. But it's more like, what does it work with, right? So if if your on-prem, like deploy, like whatever it is, service supports federation, then yeah, you can totally use it. If it doesn't support it, then you're going to be as out long of as luck. your issuer is available. Yeah, and, uh, you know the federation trust relationship can be built. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Any. So internal application, you mean uh, applications on the cluster itself? So you can use bound service account tokens for that. Like the, you know, like I mentioned, you can use projected service account tokens, which are auto mounted inside the applications and then used within the cluster. So within the cluster, there's never been a problem, but now it's even better because now you can use tokens that are time and audience bound. Yeah, and if, if you're going cluster to cluster, you can, as long as you can, as long as that OIDC endpoint is available, you can always do a validation check against that endpoint to make sure that that token is valid, and then you're good to go. Uh, thank you. In the last diagram you were showing, what was the relationship between the Spire server and the OIDC? Uh, provider. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, in the interest of time, I had just, you know, talked a little bit about it. But if you, uh, you know, I want to go a few slides back uh, here. Sorry. Yeah, so you see this workflow? It's exactly like that. Think of, uh, instead of the service account tokens, think of uh, Spire tokens, where uh, the Spire as I mentioned, has an OIDC integration. So OIDC discovery is provided by the Spire server. And instead of the, uh, you know, that the OIDC discovery here being the Kubernetes uh, service account issuer, this will be the Spire server's OIDC endpoint that you federate with the external OIDC application. Okay, thank you. We got time for one more question. Anyone, any takers? Seems not. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So much. Appreciate it.